Okay, I can't really tell if anybody's out there, um, but I'm assuming we're live now. The recording is on. Um, good evening. I'm Magistrate Judge Alex C. here in the San Francisco Division of the uh, Northern District of California. So um, uh, tonight's program, demystifying the Magistrate Judge application process, I promise you will be uh, very engaging and uh, I got a notification that everybody's here and they can see us. So that's a good sign. Um, so our rubs are off. We're going to spill the tea, as the kids like to say. I don't know if the kids say that anymore or if, if at all. But the purpose of tonight's program, um, quite frankly, I wish we had it when I applied, um, is an opportunity for you to learn about what it's like to actually apply uh, for the magistrate judge vacancy that's soon to be announced, if not uh, announcing very shortly. Um, and we're going to give you a lot of uh, interesting information, some background, and then uh, toward the end of the program, uh, our thoughts and uh, feedback on what it's like to actually apply and hopefully what will make for a very successful application. If you're here tonight uh, out there in the audience, then you've just taken the first step of acknowledging that maybe you want to be a judge and maybe this is the right time for you and maybe we can help you uh, with that decision along in the process. And we're really, our goal tonight is to um, answer some questions that people might have, might be thinking of, because we're really interested and we're really committed as the district to uh, encourage a wide variety, diverse applicant pool to do uh, as much outreach as we can, because um, I think I speak on behalf of my colleagues and you'll hear from them specifically, uh, why that's important to us. And so we're, we are very enthusiastically here tonight to, to promote that and to really ensure that we're getting as many people who may be interested in applying uh, tonight. Okay, so let me, I'm, I'm sure you already know, but um, uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the panel that's, in, that's before you tonight. Um, we have in our Oakland division, Judge Westmore, who was appointed in 2012. We have Judge Kim, who sits in San Francisco and was appointed in 2015. Judge DeMarkey from our San Jose division was appointed in 2018, and I was appointed in 2020. We do have another division in McKinleyville. Uh, they're not being represented tonight, but uh, know that you have the constellation of, of MJs from, from the entire district here who will be able to give feedback. And I invite my colleagues that if, if there's something that we're talking about that you wanna add your specific division um, uh, take on it, please ch chime in and do that. Okay, I've got a note here that says, the Zoom link in the email was a dead link, but I got in through entering the ID and password. So I don't know if anybody out there might be able in our IT to monitor that, but that might mean that some people are having problems accessing it. So, um, so, and I think Judge Kim might have actually said there was some issues with the link tonight. So I'm hoping that folks are making their way in. I apologize if you are coming in and right at the beginning, you haven't missed anything other than who we are and what we're hoping to do today. Um, great, people are commenting and saying that they can use the link in the flyer. Um, so hopefully uh, there's a way that you can get to us. Um, but, and as you can see, I'm monitoring the chat. So I encourage folks that as you have questions that you uh, that you want to forward to us in the panel, I'll help facilitate that. There will be a, a Q and A um, at the uh, at the end that you can uh, make sure that all of the questions are asked. Okay, all right. So there are 163 attendees so far. So this is working. Um, this is great. And uh, Chief Judge Spiro says hello to all of you. He's he's in, he's in the program. Okay. All right, so I'll quickly give an outline of what we're going to do. We're going to go fairly rapidly because we have a lot of ground to cover, but we think it's all pretty important, and then we'll start engaging with the panel uh, quickly. So the four topics which matches our outline is the role of the MJ in the Northern District of California, um, uh, a discussion about the qualifications of being an MJ. Then we're going to talk about the application and the selection process. And then finally, um, uh, and but not least, what makes for a successful application? Okay, let's go to the first topic. 
and what are the duties of an MJ in the Northern District? I'm gonna ask Judge Kim to first explain in terms of our civil cases, how do we get civil cases and what does it mean that the MJ is handling a civil case by consent? Okay, so in our district, we have what's called the wheel. And the wheel is how cases are randomly assigned by computer. And in our district, magistrate judges and district judges, Article Three judges, are all on the wheel. So we get a proportionate case, uh, a proportionate amount of cases assigned to us randomly. According to the statute, we can only hear a civil case for all purposes if all the parties in the case consent to our jurisdiction for all purposes. And so what happens is that we get a case off the wheel, and then a notice goes out to the parties saying, do you consent to magistrate judge C? And then both, both all the parties have to respond. And if all the parties say yes, the case would stay, for example, with Judge C, and he could hear it all the way through trial and beyond. And so that's what it means that we're on the wheel and that we get cases by consent, um, because it means that people have to agree to our jurisdiction for all purposes. But once it's ours, it's ours. So the one thing I want to point out, and those of you who might have uh, uh, friends or family that are MJs in other districts, know that some of this differs from district to district. So what you're learning tonight is specifically what happens in the Northern District of California. Some districts don't have a robust consent docket, but the Northern District of California actually, my understanding, is the gold standard for the consent cases. Our, our MJs have a high number of consents. So um, so again, um, that's, that's great. And I'm, I'm turning to Judge Westmore. MJs also have criminal calendar and criminal work. Can you describe for us what that involves? Okay, so um, each division uh, rotates what we call criminal duty uh, among the magistrate judges. So for instance, in Oakland, there are two magistrate judges. And so we are on criminal duty six months out of the year. And in San Francisco, there are six. So they are each on duty two months out of the year. And then we have San Jose where there are three magistrate judges and they are on duty four times for, per year. So what criminal duty consists of first would be presiding over the daily morning or afternoon, depending on uh, the division that we're speaking of, uh, criminal calendar. And that's Monday through Friday at the same time. And during the criminal calendar, the magistrate judges are the first judges that the criminal defendants appear in front of. So they would appear in front of us. We'd be the first spaces uh, representing the court for those criminal defendants for their initial appearances on indictments, criminal complaints, uh, supervised release and probation violation matters, detention hearings, bail review hearings, hearings on violations of pretrial release conditions, et cetera. And for felony cases, that is where the magistrate judge's duties uh, end. And the cases are set on the district judge uh, district judges' calendars through trial and sentencing. For misdemeanor cases, however, the magistrate judges keep those from the initial appearance through trial and sentencing. Petty offenses don't require consent of the parties, but if the charges uh, involve a class A misdemeanor, then the magistrate judges routinely keep them through trial and sentencing on consent of the parties. Um, largely uh, in the same way that was described by Judge Kim, except for it's much faster. Parties usually just consent right away at the first appearance. Uh, criminal duty also includes receiving, reviewing, uh, and issuing search warrants and other investigatory orders. Magistrate judges also preside over uh, the returns of indictments by the grand jury. Uh, and usually the magistrate judges have the pleasure of presiding over the selection and impanelment of the grand juries for each division every 18 months. So that about sums it up. Okay, there, there's a lot. Arguably there's a lot, it's, we've covered a huge list. And again, as I, as I said before, uh, these might be very unique tasks 
to the Northern District of California. Um, all right, I'm going to turn back to discover, uh, to civil work to Judge DeMarkey and have her uh, describe the, the work that MJs do in connection with discovery and settlement conferences. Sure. So in civil cases where the magistrate judge does not have consent, we might have portions of a case uh, referred to us, um, specifically discovery matters. Um, it's up to the district judge in two of our three divisions um, to decide whether to keep discovery matters um, or refer them out to a magistrate judge. In San Jose, we have a little bit of a different tradition, which is um, the magistrate judges are automatically assigned as a discovery referral judge for each case that is assigned to a district judge. So we'll handle discovery disputes um, in civil cases. And in addition, um, on the civil side, we also get referred settlement conferences. And those are referred district-wide. We could get settlement conference referrals from any judge in the district. Um, and that comprises a lot of the work we do on the civil side. And there are some other miscellaneous things for which we might have referrals. If we don't have complete consent, but a case is assigned to us and there's a party in default, we may end up doing um, a, a reassignment to a district judge with a recommendation for how mm -hmm. that should be resolved. Um, this might differ from division, but can a magistrate judge be assigned to be both discovery and a settlement judge? Yes, they can, <laughs> at least in San Jose. Um, but, but actually, in all seriousness, um, we are very sensitive to the question of whether um, that's a suitable thing in an, any given case. And so it may vary from case to case, if, uh, and certainly if the parties have any concern about that. You may end up uh, doing both or one or the other. Okay, so that might be something that's unique to the division that you might notice. One of the things that I, I neglected to mention is why we're convening the, this webinar now. We, we are fortunate enough to have a, a, a vacancy soon. Judge Corley will be uh, soon, hopefully, uh, confirmed to be a district court judge, and so there will be a, a opening in San Francisco. So we anticipate that the next opening will be in San Francisco. Um, okay. All right, let's now pivot to the uh, maybe not so clear uh, qualifications. What, how, how do we determine what, who is qualified to be an MJ? Um, and for those of you that like the law, this is actually codified in the code, Title 28, Section 631. Um, will do you the benefit of summarizing the relevant part of it, which is that you must be at least five years in good standing, uh, determined to be competent to perform the duties of the office. And then the district court establishes what is called a merit selection panel, uh, which is composed of residents of the judicial district to assist the courts in identifying and recommending persons who are best qualified to fit the position. So if you think that you've met all three, then guess what, you're qualified. Um, but let's let's dig a little bit deeper into what this might mean and to give some context in, in what we do as magistrate judges. And um, so I'm going to start with Judge DeMarkey. And I have a question. If I'm thinking about applying to be an MJ, but I haven't done any criminal work or I haven't done any civil work, um, should I still apply? Short answer is yes, you should. Um, so as you can see from the description that we've all given so far of what the magistrate judge duties are, there's a huge variety. It's one of the great attractions of the position, but as you can see, it, it encompasses so many different areas, civil and criminal, and it would be extremely unusual for someone to have experience in all of those different areas. So certainly it's, uh, it's an advantage to have deep experience in civil law or criminal law or both, but it's certainly not um, expected that uh, the qualified applicant will have deep experience in all areas of civil and criminal practice. So you shouldn't um, decide not to apply because say you haven't done any criminal law, for example. And um, turning to Judge Kim, if I practice mostly in state court, so I have very little experience in federal court, or maybe I have very little experience, period. Um, am I at a handicap? Am I gonna really suffer? Am I not gonna be a strong candidate? What are your thoughts on that? 
think it's okay to have a large state court practice with a smaller federal practice, but I think the important thing is you have to have some federal experience. Um, in my case, the majority of my practice was in state court, but I had been a federal law clerk. And as I told people, sort of like when I think about evidence, I always thought about it in terms of federal evidence code sections because I learned the law, the language in that, and I would always convert it over to the California evidence code. So I had, I, I don't think it's a, uh, it's not something that will disqualify you, but you must have some type of federal experience, whether it's on the civil side or on the criminal side. Okay. And now to, to, to Judge West, Westmore, um, I actually, I'm, I'm an associate or maybe even a junior partner in a very large law firm, and we don't go to trial. We, we actually do our best not to go to trial. And I've never mediated a case. I've been to plenty of mediations. Should I... Should I apply? Am I a viable candidate? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that, again, is the short answer. You should apply. Um, most uh, civil litigators end up not going to trial because most cases don't go to trial. I would say maybe 90%, if not more, of all civil cases end up being resolved through law in motion or settlement. So, um, the fact that you haven't made it all the way to trial does not mean that you are not qualified. There are a whole lot of things that you do have experience with when you litigate a case, whether it's criminal or civil. You have experience with dealing with the case from the filing through the litigation process. And so you have dealt with all of the issues uh, in the case. Most of the time you've gone through the law and motion process You've dealt with the rules of evidence. You've dealt with objections to evidence. Sometimes cases don't end up going to trial, but they go very far. They get close to trial and then they end up settling uh, just before trial. And so you've had a great deal of experience all the way up to just before trial, which is where most the bulk, the bulk of the work is done. And if you have federal experience, then you also have dealt with a lot of the uh, issues that you're going that are going to be involved in the trial uh, before the trial, because here in the Northern District, uh, the judges address all of most of the evidentiary uh, issues up front. So we deal with a lot of the issues at our pretrial conferences. And so there are, you know, you're dealing with rulings on uh, objections to evidence, motions in limine, you've really done a whole lot more than you think uh, just because you have not actually gone through the trial process or maybe you've only done it once or twice um, doesn't mean that you are not qualified. You have more than enough uh, information. With respect to um, uh, serving as a mediator, if you have, for instance, if you haven't served as a mediator before, I don't think most of the magistrate judges have actually served as mediators before becoming a magistrate judge, but you have a lot of skills that you can draw upon. Um, you, you have actually participated, as you mentioned, uh, in mediations as an attorney representing your clients at mediation. So you have a good sense of how mediations work, you have a good sense of mediation styles. Um, you may have been to settlement conferences with a judge, so you know how those work. Uh, and then you also have to think about what kinds of qualities you have that would make a good mediator. So, you know, you think about all of your experience and some of the good qualities that make a some qualities that make a good mediator might be uh, being a good listener, an active listener, having patience, empathy, good intuition, perseverance. You don't give up on people. You give them that chance to uh, get the case resolved. Don't throw in the towel. You, remain, you can remain objective. You have credibility based on your experience, your knowledge of the case, your, the, your knowledge of the law, your authenticity. 
uh, and you have empathy. And you know that's not an exhaustive list, but those are sort of a list of some of the qualities that you might think about um, in terms of your experience. And do you have those good qualities that would make a good mediator? And if you if the answer is yes, then you are qualified and you are not at a disadvantage. Great, thank you. I know from my own experience being a new magistrate my first year, the first time that I worked on a trade secret case, having never done that, having never touched that area, and thinking on the one hand, wow, what am I doing in this case? But also echoing Judge DeMarkey's point, that's one of the true benefits of the job is the exposure that you have to just a diverse caseload and experience. And you're applying your judgment and your skills from your other parts of your career and life to the job. Um, and so you're going to be learning and you're also going to be doing things fresh and new regardless. So no one's going to have everything. No one's going to have done everything. And we're all learning as we go. But, you know, we trust our judgment and our experience from the past to lead us forward. I'm going to incorporate a question from the audience and I'll, I'll leave it, I'll, I'll pose it to the entire panel. Um, so do we get training? And if we get training for how long? Well, I would like to touch on one thing that you just said before directly answering that question. Yes. It reminds me of why this job is such a great job and how much fun it is to do this job. Because every day, I mean, literally every day, I learn something new. Every day you show up to work, it's exciting to see what kind of new issue is going to be before you. What kind of case are you going to be working on? No doubt you are going to come across um, a case on an issue or an area of law that you've never dealt with before. But that's the exciting part, right? That's part of the journey. That's part mm -hmm. of the fun of the job. And so you just apply your excellent research skills and you take joy in figuring out the answer to these questions um, and learning the particular area of law that you've never dealt with before. And I'm telling you, that's sort of on the top of my list for why I love being a magistrate judge because it's never boring, it's never repetitive. It's always something new and a new experience and uh, we're constantly learning. And I've talked to some of our more senior colleagues and they tell me even to this day, they're still learning. They're still learning something new. Um, and so I got off on a tangent <laughs> about no, that, but, yeah. but I really felt like I should uh, express that because I think people think that just because, you know, I haven't dealt with a trade secret issue or I haven't dealt with a patent uh, case before that I'm not qualified and that just simply is not the case. No one has dealt with every I'd be happy to talk about the training because I'm relatively new. <laughs> So we, we have what's called baby judge school where you, the federal judicial center actually does provide training and you go and meet with the other new magistrate judges and have that training. We also have an in-house training, but candidly, most of the learning is on the job training. And um, what happens is if you get this job, you'll be calling your colleagues a lot. I would say that when I started my job, Judge Sparrow is in, our Chief Judge Sparrow is in the audience. I called him probably every single day and that was fine. We have a really collegial bench here. It is fine to email or pick up the phone or walk down the hall to your colleague and ask, I've never seen this before, what the heck do I do? So I would say we do have really good training. We have wonderful manuals and guidelines, but most of the job is on the job training. Judge Mark, you want to weigh in on your uh, training? Well, I, yes, and, and training. I, I think I'm uh, apart from you, Judge C. I'm the, I'm the newest one on this panel. But um, but between the time that I left my uh, private law firm practice and I started as a magistrate judge, I had been through at least one session of baby judge school. But I also I sat in on criminal proceedings because I had no experience in criminal proceedings. Sat on a lot of cr criminal matters to try to understand what went on. And not only did I do that, but then afterwards I went back and I would talk to Judge Cousins or I would talk to Judge Van Kulen and I would say, okay, what did you do? And why did you do that? <laughs> and you know, they they spent so much time explaining to me exactly what was happening. So to echo Judge Kim, it was really beneficial to have such generous colleagues who will help you out at the beginning. 
I did the same thing with settlement conferences. I said, and I want to judge Kim's settlement conferences and a number of the other magistrate judges settlement conferences and then talk to them afterwards about how did they do things. So there, there is a lot of um, work you can do in advance, but until you actually have to do it yourself, uh, that's where the real learning comes in. Yeah, I agree. I, I love our bench. I mean, it is we have the best relationships and I was able to shadow judges when I first started um, on the bench back in 2012 as well as I shadowed judges in various different proceedings. And um, I needed to get experience in presiding over criminal matters as well. So I was able to shadow multiple uh, magistrate judges during criminal duty. And I had a more senior magistrate judge um, actually sit with me for several weeks before I was on my own. So we do have our own in-house training of sorts. And I wanna add that um, you know, on certain questions, obviously we have different jobs, but I found going to DJs and DJs actually helping us out too. So if you have questions about trial questions or things like that, our DJs are just as available to us to answer it. So that might actually uh, give you some idea that, you know, what is an MJ's life here? Is it completely separate from the DJ's life? We are one court and we have different jobs. And, but I feel very comfortable going to a DJ and getting their input on what's, what I should be doing in trial. Um, and, and so that's an available resource, but um, it is definitely a job where you have to learn as you go and you have to make decisions quickly. Um, and sometimes with very limited information. And so it does require some confidence and inner grit to kind of muddle through things. Um, but um, I think we do that every day and sometimes we do it right. And sometimes we learn from our mistakes. Um, but it is, it is a job that offers that challenge. And I think um, it, is, uh, it, it is quite rewarding if, we're, if you're hearing that plenty of times. Um, one, one question I think is, um, uh, and we did get some, we did touch upon it. Um, but what is the breakdown between, this is a question from the audience, civil and criminal? Do, do people have a good gauge of that? Do you have a, a numeric? Do you, I think it varies. Uh, obviously, if you're on duty, it's almost all criminal during that duty period. Um, but duty activity, criminal duty creeps up in our civil. It may be honor. different. It may be different, uh, slightly different from uh, division to division. division, to division because like, a, you know, as I mentioned, um, you know, in Oakland, there are only two magistrate judges, so we are on duty six months out of the year. So we have um, quite a bit of the duty, um, and that does take up a lot of your time during your duty months. But overall, you know, I would say that it's, you know, maybe represents no more than 20% um, of what we do. And for others, it may be 10 or 15%. I, I mean, you'd have to hear from Judge Kim and Judge DeMarkey on that. I always say that my work breaks down roughly to a third criminal, a third my own consent cases, and a third settlement conferences. That's how I would break down my roughly. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I think about in there is right. It, it's been so different during the pandemic when we've had sort of um, consolidated duty calendars. Those were very mm. intense months. Um, but, you know, in general, the I would say the bulk of what I do is civil overall. Right, when we were doing consolidated ca uh, calendars, it was sort of like upside down almost. It felt like we were doing uh, criminal in 100% of the time during certain months. Um, those were I, I um, okay, I'm sorry. Um, uh, a question came up and back to the qualifications. If I've only been a judicial law clerk, do you think I can be a magistrate judge? What are, do people have thoughts on people that have only been clerks? I think we might have had people who are MJs who were law clerks for a long time. So I, I, don't, my, I, don't think I think that answer could be yes. I don't think we've ever had anyone who was only a law clerk. I yeah. think we've had people who had long periods of time as a law clerk, but I think you have to have some experience handling a case yourself. You have to, if you're going to be the one making the decision, you have to have been in some position where you're making the decisions alone. I think the district judges would have some pause if you haven't ever had a job where you make, you're making the hard decisions and you're responsible for them. And it doesn't have and to be in a certain, it, 
it, it could vary by context, but it would have to be where you are the decision maker. Also, if I'm not mistaken, I think in the qualifications um, for the job, you can only count two years of your law clerk time uh, towards your experience. If I'm not mistaken, I think that's what it says. So you do need to get some other practice experience. Okay, hopefully that answers the question. Um, okay, let's move to the application and selection process. Um, I'd like to begin with a question to the, to the panel, because I, I would find this interesting if I were in the audience, and that is uh, for each of us, or why did we decide to apply when we did? What, what kind of triggered us to make the jump to submit the application? And um, so feel free to share your experience or lack of experience in the process. I'll start with Judge Kim. So I was a law clerk to a federal district court judge in our district, and I saw what a great job it was. And it was always in the back of my mind that I'd like to be on the bench. Um, and so I applied many times for the job that I have. I applied five times and I was successful on my fifth time over a period of about 20 years. So I'm probably, I think I have the record for applying the most and finally getting the job. Um, but it was always in the back of my mind because I saw what a great job it is. And I didn't want to practice law. I love being a lawyer, but I thought I'd really like to have this job someday. But Candace, has, Judge Westmore has a very different story. Judge Westmore. Well, um, my decision to apply really came at the urging of uh, my colleagues um, and mentors. I, I think that they saw how much I loved um, digging, really digging into the law. In the last few years um, of my time as an attorney, I focused on largely on civil law in motion and appellate work. So I was in my office just, you know, with piles and piles of research, you know, really digging in to try to figure out the answer to difficult questions and taking on comp complex um, cases and sort of being a resource for people in my office. Um, and it just seemed that the magistrate judge job uh, would really fit my interests because I had the opportunity to be a trial attorney and try cases. But the thing that I loved the most was researching the law um, and writing uh, and arguing uh, law and motion matters and appeals. And turns out that they were right because coming over to be a magistrate judge, that's what I do. I, I'm literally still doing the same thing, which is researching uh, extensively and trying to understand these cases and figure out what the right answer is and writing um, orders on them. And so I, I'm really happy that other people took notice of what they saw in me and recommended uh, that I apply. Just marking. Um, yes. Yeah, so I clerked for a federal district judge, not in this district, and I thought it was a great job, but it never occurred to me that I would ever be on the bench. I didn't have that as a career goal. I just didn't think that um, it was a path for me. So I uh, worked at DOJ in the civil division for two years, and then I went to a private law firm where I was, uh, I did patent litigation for over 20 years. So I stayed in the same place for 20 years. And then it was during a uh, trial that our trial graphics person said, hey, Virginia, I think you'd be a good judge. And that's when I started thinking about it. So it wasn't until very, very late in my career that I even considered it. Uh, and then I also applied multiple times. I think I applied twice before I was successful. Um, and the reason I chose to was not just because the trial graphics guy suggested it, but because I was at the point in my career where I thought I might actually be good at this. I had had trial experience. I had handled a lot of complex civil matters. I had extensive experience in federal court. Um, and I'd also started, um, I 
had experience in firm management. I'd been my firm's general counsel. So I sort of felt like I was ready. And it was at a point in my career where I also was thinking, hey, I'd really like to get back to working in a public service capacity, like I did very, very early in my career. And so this seemed like a good option. And that's why I applied. I didn't so, realize that. Uh, I didn't realize that that you had someone also recommend that to you, Judge Tomar. Yes, um, it was yeah. probably a joke, but. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's very important for people in the audience to hear because a lot of people might think that, um, or may never have thought of being a judge. I'm also in that category. I never thought I would be a judge until somebody just threw it out there. Um, and until somebody, especially if you're, you don't have a lot of lawyers in your family, or you don't have a, you might be a first generation lawyer, first generation grad student, something out there, which you don't have a lot of exposure to this. And until somebody who has been around and can tell you, what did you, what do you think about this? Um, that might be just the incentive you need to think about it. And that's part of the process, because then I will also echo what Judge DeMarkey said, that for me personally, I wouldn't submit an application. I wouldn't think to submit an application until I knew I had some ability to actually credibly campaign for it. Okay, I can do this. Um, because you need some of that in order to do the job. You can't take this job without having the confidence in yourself that you can actually do it. So you have to feel confident in your skills and your background to do it. But as you can see, most of us never thought that we'd be a judge. We were happy in our careers. Um, I was in public sector work for most, if not all but four years of my career. I too made this transition uh, fairly deep into my career. Um, and I was also looking to continue public service, um, but also thinking, I think my life would be um, interesting um, to no longer be an advocate, um, which is which has been a transition. Um, at, be, no longer being an advocate and being a judge is, is a transition for all of us new judges. Um, it's a new role, but it's also welcomed at certain point in time. Um, so as you can see, we all have different reasons for becoming a judge and why we were, um, but ultimately um, we're here um, because we made the decision to apply and and um, and so I'm hoping hoping that there's people out there that are that if we can encourage you to submit an application um, that that you can do that. And this, right. I'll just add yes. that this is this is really truly public service. Uh, yes. You know, for me, it's public service continued because I also did um, I worked uh, in public service for the city attorney's office in Oakland for 13 years before applying. Um, and it's just, it's very fulfilling if you're someone who loves public service, but we also have people who have come from uh, the private sector as well. Okay, let's turn to the application and, and get some details about that. So soon the application for the opening will be posted. Um, it's daunting. Um, if you haven't looked at it, it is, but obviously you can do it. We did it. Um, so there's an application. There's also that is somewhat unique from other judicial applications. Um, uh, there's, uh, as I mentioned before, a merit selection panel. So the chief judge, I believe, selects the members of this panel. And um, the panels are uh, made up of five attorneys in the community and two members from the community who are not lawyers. So there are a total of seven committee members. And the charge of the panel is to determine the most qualified and to recommend to the district court um, the top five, as we refer to it. So there are five candidates out of this pool uh, that will advance to, uh, to the DJs for a vote for the ultimate selection. And um, in terms of the top five, the DJs, if they get the top five from the committee, and they don't feel like they can select anyone, they can go back to the panel and ask the panel to resubmit a new list of top five. So the panel will recommend the top five candidates. In terms of that actual process, the committee, I've actually served on the committee uh, for a prior selection and the, and the committee has its own discretion on how many candidates are going to interview. Um, and anecdotally, I've been informed that each 
um, panel usually draws between 40 to 60 applicants, uh, but one selection was as high as 80. So it does vary from, from opening to opening, but it's, it is highly competitive. Um, but don't let that discourage you. I mean, all good jobs probably are very highly competitive. Um, and if you're here at this uh, webinar, I would assume you're very interested in at least finding out what that's about. Um, so the interview process by the committee, um, at least for mine and, and others can chime in what their own experience was, it's a, it's a panel interview. Um, as a candidate, I was interviewed by the Merit Selection Panel um, and there was only one interview. Um, and then from there, um, you're told how you, you do if you advance to the top five. Um, are there other uh, comments or uh, I, if you want to share your experience and what it was like going through this, this is a good time to do it. People like it. People, was it fun? Was it not fun? I applied twice, so I got it the second time that I applied and I was encouraged to continue to apply. Uh, to apply the second time, you know, I know people who have applied and did not apply a second time. And I would just really encourage you, if you have applied for one of these positions before and you did not get the job, do not take it personally. There are a lot of applications uh, and there are a lot of qualified applicants. And, you know, the, I was told by Judge Hamilton that if you apply and you apply again, now your name is more familiar the second time than it was, you know, the first time you apply. So that could be something that is in, you know, plays in your favor. So don't think of it as, well, they didn't want me, so I'm not going to apply again. You should definitely apply. And I think um, Judge Kim uh, is sort of, you know, the poster child for that now. If she, if she, she has proudly, the record, she probably owns it too. Yeah, and if she has the record, I'm, you know, I'm not sure if that's right, but maybe she does have the record for applying five times. You know, you can. She probably has some really great tips for all of you uh, about what she did from application to application as well. And, and just to be unanimous, I too applied uh, two times. So uh, I think we're, we're unanimous here. We're, we, it's taken us a couple of application cycles to get through. Mm -hmm. um, so we, I, I don't know if that means that's what you have to. I'm sure there, there are people out there who, who got the job on their first try, but know that there's no shame if you don't get it. And I will, I will say that others have said that if there's, there's something to be said about your interest and in showing your interest in the position by being a, a, a repeat applicant. And, and I think I certainly learn more from my second time around and incredibly so. I think I even made it, made a point to tell the panel that I'm serious about this job. I've applied for it before. So there's something to be said. I, one uh, jurist um, said that the benefit of, of multiple applications is that you get your name out there so that people can now view you as somebody who wants to be a judge because certain people might not think of you as a judge because they haven't seen that interest in you. So do not be discouraged if you think it might be a little early um, or you might not have everything that you wanna have. Um, don't let that be a deterrent because you might have to apply again and that's, there's no harm as you can say. Um, no, one one thing I wanna say also is that uh, we're, we're talking to people because we have an opening right now, but there are probably people in the audience who aren't quite ready to, to apply for this job, for this particular position. And there'll be some openings in the future as well, because as people re retire, the opening there will be openings. And so what I would say is because I have this experience of applying um, over a long period of time, several times, there are things you can do to, we, to bolster your, uh, your weaknesses. In other words, I knew because I had worked in private litigation, I didn't go to trial very much. And so I went out and I decided, you know what, I'm, I enjoy trials. I went out of my way to take trials. I also didn't have criminal experience. So I volunteered at the Santa Clara County District Attorney's Office on my own time as a volunteer deputy district attorney to get some criminal experience. Partly because I also wanted to find out, do I like it? Do I dislike it? What if I get on the bench and I hate the criminal side? What am I gonna do then? I also sat as a temporary judge in Santa Clara County Court. Again, for the same thing. Do I like it? Do I not like it? How am I going to feel about making decisions, especially on the fly in small claims court? I did all those things in the meantime because I thought those are the areas where I am weak and I need to bolster them, both for my career, 
as a litigator, but also because I needed to find out whether I really wanted to have this kind of job. And I actually was able to strengthen my application over time, but it didn't happen overnight. So those of you who are out there thinking, I don't have these qualifications, I don't have all the things I need for the job, you can do it over time. But I think that it's good if you aren't ready now to start thinking long term about what you want to do in your career and how you're going to get there. One other thing I'll add is that um, the application is extensive and it, it's going to require a lot of time to um, sort of just gather all the information. Um, and so if you're interested in applying, you should start now uh, because in addition to, to just recalling all of the cases that, that you've done that, that are called for to be described in the application, um, you also need to have um, uh, people who are references. So you need to kind of reach out to those folks and make sure that they're prepared to, um, to be references for you. Uh, and then switching to, I saw some questions in the chat about the, the actual um, merit selection panel process and the, the, you know, the interviewing process if you're selected for that. Um, I prepared for those interviews, both the interview with the panel and the interview with the district judges committee, um, like I would for a, for a hearing or an oral argument. So I really, it, it, you know, I, I tried to anticipate what I would be asked and um, tried to reflect on, you know, the areas where I didn't have experience and what would I say um, to Judge Westmore's point, you know, what are the things that I would say um, make me think I would be good at, at being a neutral since I haven't done it before, those kinds of things. So it really requires, I think, um, a lot of reflection uh, and preparation, just like you would for a really important argument or hearing. Judge DeMarkey, tell them about your file. Oh, <laughs> well, I did keep a massive file on uh, not just my application, but I went and I, I researched, um, I, I found Judge Kim's interview on um, what it was like to interview <laughs> when she did it for me. So I had that in my file. And then after the first time I applied and I was unsuccessful, I tried to write down all of the questions that I had been asked by the merit selection panel so that I'd be ready the next time with uh, all the questions. So I, I still have all of that material. <laughs> I'm kind of a pack rat, but um, but yes, so, I did. I used it to prepare. So let's get as 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 specific as we can. The actual application has many questions. They ask all about your background. You'll have to gather up your resume, obviously, but you have to talk about cases that you worked on, opposing counsel that you worked with or or opposed. You have to disclose who they are because the committee will be re, will be talking to them, and so you need to pick who it is that you want them to talk to. You have to pick about what cases because there, the, there are only three of them, I think, uh, that you have to talk about, and you have to select which case cases that reflect your skills, but also you can highlight. And I know that I chose one of my cases, not because I did a great job. In fact, it was a bad result, but I needed to be able to show the committee how I got out of a bad result and what I did to show that I can act under pressure or that I made decisions under pressure and what I was being faced with. And so you want to have a thought about your application to be able to convey to the committee as well as to the DJs why you have the positives or the traits that you think uh, would make you a successful judge. Um, so in terms of the application, since we're, we're, we're getting, hopefully getting as, as detailed as we can, there are gonna be questions that you have nothing to say. And there were questions that I had no response to. I didn't feel very comfortable and maybe others can chime in, but that's what it is. Maybe others can comment if you have sections that are completely blank. What did you feel like? Obviously not. You applied, but how do you? What do you do with that, if anything? You just answer them, and then if you have nothing to say, you have nothing to say. But I think right. what you need to do is, I think you're right. You need to focus on what your strengths are, and let me say something about those cases. The application is very similar uh, in terms of asking for your trials and the most notable cases you've ever had, similar to the state court application. So if you have that already, you're in good luck. But if you are actually gathering information about cases that you've that you had a list on them and they're the ones that you think are the most important in your career, it takes time to get them because you have to have the case number, you have to have the uh, names and the addresses of opposing counsel and you have to be able to uh, format all that. So 
I remember the names of my cases, but I couldn't remember the case number. So I had to dig back into files. I had to call people. I had to search online. It took a lot of time to do that. So I would recommend getting started on that, thinking about what cases you would list and then start finding what those case numbers are and getting the names and the addresses of your opposing counsel. Because I thought that was really time consuming and actually quite mm -hmm. difficult for old cases that were before ECF. Yes, I, I agree with you. I had to do a lot of digging and, you know, in our, in my office database, and I had to go to the court records and figure out, you know, who was who and what their addresses were. And then you need to get the latest address because, because you want to provide a, an accurate address or current address and phone number so that, that people can be reached. You know, it's a really um, a tedious process and you don't realize that until you start uh, working on the application, just how long it takes. So I would reiterate that if you're interested, you should just start filling out the application uh, now, even if it's not for a current opening. How did you go about, I'll throw this to the entire panel, because you have to disclose, you know, a significant case, I believe that's what it's described as, you have to disclose the opposing counsel in your significant case. How did you choose that case? Well, because I didn't have a whole lot of trials, um, I made sure to include those <laughs> because mm -hmm. I felt like that was really important to include, you know, one uh, jury trial and one uh, bench trial. And, you know, I wanted to make sure that I included, you know, a class action matter or something, uh, you know, with more complexity so that you're showing Yes, I have trial experience. I know how to try, I know how to select a jury. I know how to try a case before a jury. Um, I know how to, you know, make, do oral argument at the court of appeals, or I know how to uh, litigate a, you know, complicated, um, you know, a, a complicated FLSA uh case or something of that nature or a uh, collective action. Um, and so I think that to the extent that you can pick those cases that allow you to pull out those, you know, discrete skills, um, mm -hmm. that's, what, that's how you want to strategize mm -hmm. the ones. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if you've worked for 10 or 15 or 20 years, you have so many cases um, it's hard to decide. So I would say pick the ones that represent the different skills that you want the panel to know uh, that you have. I think that is answering a question that's really a good question is can you select cases that were that had very successful results without going to trial or even a case maybe that was even filed that you can talk about work that you've done. Um, and I think that's the most important thing is you want to tell the committee and the DJs an example of your good work and, um, and, and use that to promote your application and your skill set, as opposed to just because it's a trial. Judge Westmore is right though. I mean, if you have trial experience, you gotta be able to show that part of your portfolio. Um, but sometimes a lot of people don't have it. So they have to amplify these skills and traits with other parts of the work that they do. Um, Okay, uh, Judge Mark, do you have anything that you want to add on, on this? About how, say, how did you pick your cases? Well, I mean, it, it wasn't hard to figure out which were the most significant cases. I, I, I felt, I mean, there's some, you know, recency and significance factors that went into it. But what I would add to what Judge Westmore was describing is that if you are going to list a case, and maybe it's from some several years ago, and you're listing your opposing counsel, it might be polite to give them the heads up that they might get a call so that they're not like, who? Who's that? I don't remember. You know, so just giving them a heads up that that they might receive a call, and this is why. So, and I want to say on the point of you know if you have a good result or a bad result, but you have a good lesson from that bad result um, in a case that did not go to trial, it's still just as good to show your abilities and your skills. And in any event, uh, the Northern District. Um, court is largely a law in motion court anyway, because most of the cases are resolved through law in motion. So to include, you know, a case that required, you know, a certain amount of complex, you know, 
uh, analysis um, and motion practice, oral argument um, would be a good item for you to include on your application. Um, I, I, I want to add, because um, for me, I, I, I did want to figure out who was going to be the opposing counsel I knew they were going to call. And um, judicial temperament is extremely important. Not only do you have to convey that you have proper temperament to be a judge, but you want to be able to advocate that you have proper temperament, even in the most strained circumstances. And that's why I think they talk to opposing counsel. Um, and I think I wanted to not only pick someone who I found very able and a good lawyer that I thought was a good lawyer, but one that I didn't necessarily agree with on everything and that they could express how I handled conflict from an advocate to the person who was calling about me. So in choosing your um, uh, adversary, you wanna choose someone that will speak candidly and, and, and fairly about you because everyone's gonna know that you know, somebody who speaks highly of you, even though we're opposing counsel, but your best friends might not be the most credible uh, depiction of your skills and your temperament. But give give the committee someone that you trust. Ultimately, you should trust whoever you're telling um, uh, will be will speak fairly about your uh, your skills. Um, I have one technical question that was for me about how to format the actual application. Um, which I think is a fair question. I mean, I, my advice is when you prepare your application, have somebody review it for typos. Um, you, want a, you want a good, clean copy. Um, it is speaking about your attention to detail. Um, and that can't be stressed enough is that, you know, you're going to be issuing orders that represent the court and you want to be able to show that some written work product of yours uh, survives the scrutiny of somebody who, who goes through all of that. I don't know if any, anyone here on the panel wishes to chime in about the actual application and how to, how to put it together. Um, okay. It's been so long for me, but I, I do recall having at least two or three people who I trusted and respected review it for me before submitting it. I think that's uh, very good advice. Um, okay. All right, let's see. I, like um, Judge Westmore and Judge C, I did have someone else read my application for me. And it was one of my, my friends and form, then my partner at the time. And she said, you know, your application is so dry, Sally. There's no you in it. Your personality is not in your application at all. And so I actually went back and rewrote my essay. And the only way I can describe it is, for those of you who, God help you, have children who are applying to college, it's like the personal statement on a college essay. You know, there's this one general question, of course, why do you want to be a magistrate judge? And that was the question that I thought I need to rewrite it and I need to put my personality back in it. Dorky as it is, I'm going to talk about how I love the law, which is the truth. And, you know, I'm a nerd and that's okay. And it was me. And I thought it is kind of like a personal statement in that you want your true personality to come out. And so people can see what that is. And I read a lot of the other applications, and I see that they're somewhat dry. I mean, people, I don't think people, people are afraid to put their personalities in that, in that statement, which I think is sort of like their personal statement. And I think that's a mistake because what you bring to the table, of course, there's so many people who are smart, so many people who are good at what they do and um, experience, but what you bring to the table, it could be something very different. And mm -hmm. I think if you, you might be shortchanging yourself if you don't actually highlight that. I think that's really important. And one thing that Judge C mentioned was that he talked about a case that didn't have a good result. And I thought that was great, you know, because we don't want someone without humility on the bench. That's terrifying to me to have someone who thinks that she or he is the greatest person on earth all the time. Being able to talk credibly about a bad experience and what you learn from it actually says so much more than just talking about what a great lawyer you are. So I would just give you those two pieces of advice when you're going through the application process and writing your statements and thinking about how you want to present yourself. Put your true self in there and make it interesting. What is interesting about you? What do you bring to the table that's different from other people? And if you do have an experience that went badly, but you learned something from it, I think that's a very positive thing to talk about in this kind of application process. I promise you it won't hurt you if you can talk about it in a way that shows that you learn from it and that you have experience that will help you later on. 
I think the authenticity in this application, it has to come through. You have to be able to show who you are to the judges, to yourself. You got to figure out what kind of judge you're going to be. When you handle cases that are so sensitive in criminal cases, um, detention issues that we handle, there has to be some idea of who you are and how you're going to rule. And that can only come out if you can reflect all of that in your application, because this is probably the most um, personal thing other than going to college and writing that, but this is an extremely personal process. And it's, and it has to be, you, you're, you're being asked very personal things about yourself, your skills, why you should be a judge. And so treat the application process and the application itself uh, to forward that so that whoever's going to read is going to know who you are. Um, I think I, 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 I still think that that was a really actually positive aspect of this application process going through it was I actually had to figure out if I wanted to be a judge and why. Um, and if you can't even convince yourself when you go through the application that you want to be a judge, then maybe it's just not the right time. Or maybe your application needs to be more uh, compelling in that way so that you can advocate for yourself in that way. Um, and I think can, I'd like to add yes. just to what you're saying that that carries over into the interview process. Yes. I think when you go before the merit selection panel, you have a panel made up of attorneys from different backgrounds, different area practice areas, and you have a couple of people who you know may not be attorneys. Um, they want to know where you are. So have a conversation with them. Let them mm -hmm. see who mm -hmm. you are. Share your background. Share your life experience and how it for, informs, you know, who you are today. Um, and, you know, let them determine whether or not they think they can see you in this position of such awesome responsibility and whether or not you have the right temperament for the job. And the only way they can do that is if you let them see you, let them see who you are. Um, okay, I have another question here that I think is very, it's a good question. How important are the people you list as a reference? Do you want people who know you well or people who are connected? What are your thoughts on that? I think it's good to have a mix. And again, it's just like when you're, I'm sorry, I'm harping this college application process, but it's just like when you're, when you're getting your references for college, you want a, someone who knows you well, yeah. because it doesn't matter if the person's the most connected, politically powerful person in the world, if he or she cannot talk about you as a person and who you are. I mean, ideally you'd have someone who has both, but that's, you know, that happens so rarely. You really mm -hmm. want someone who can be a good advocate for you and talk about specific issues specifics, examples, because believe me, when the judges call, they're going to ask for specifics. That's right. Yeah, I agree. And they, and they should, you might want to have somebody who can talk about you as a person. And then you might, you know, someone who's known you for many years would be a good person to have so they can talk about who you are for real in the world um, and give concrete examples of who you are um what kind of judgment you have what kind of skills you've developed over the years and then you might want to have somebody who's um actually seen your work seen the quality of your work um observed you you know in court and then having somebody who knows a lot of influential people can't hurt but you don't want to have i wouldn't choose somebody like that just because just for that purpose they also need to know specifics about you. I agree with both Judge Westmore and Judge Kim. And um, I, uh, I had a mix um, with mine and one was kind of serendipitous, which I'll just share because it was a little bit unusual. Um, I, I had somebody I worked with um, who was a reference for me. And then I had a judge before whom I had done a trial in a different district. And I didn't know this judge at all outside the courtroom. And so kind of an unusual um, person to be a reference for me, but um, it had gotten back to me that the judge had told uh, a law clerk who had clerked for her 20 years before that I had done a good job in her courtroom. And so 
I took the risk and reached out to her and asked her if she would serve as a reference. And she said, yes. Um, so it was someone who didn't know me very well and only knew me in the context of this one rather long case and it was out of district. So, um, so it, I think that I, the point being, there can be different people in different contexts who know, who know different things about you that can be effective references. And it is good to have a mix. And, and I think what I'm hearing is that the reference really does have to know you to be a, a very meaningful one. You can have a wow reference, um, but if that person doesn't really know you, it's gonna have very limited impact. Uh, on the, the reviewer of your application. So um, this is all very, very good advice. Um, let's switch to our DJ round interview. Uh, since you make it out of the committee, you persuaded seven people that you've made the top five, and now you're gonna meet with the DJs. Um, how do you prepare? We know that Virginia has the questions already, but how do you, <laughs> how do you prepare for this interview? I mean, these are judges that we've only appeared in front of maybe. Uh, but now they're probing and they're looking at our application and they're reading very personal things about us. Um, how do how do we prepare and how do we handle it? I'll start Honestly, with Judge. You did it five times. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Probably I'm has it down to a science. <laughs> I, I, no, I'm I'm actually kind of embarrassed to say I did no preparation. I thought <laughs> at this point. I'm either going to get the job or I'm not going to get the job. <laughs> and I will say candidly, I thought the judge's interview was far less about, about um, the cases and my work and more about me as a person. Because mm -hmm. I think the judges assume, okay, everyone who gets it to this point could do the job. The question is, what kind of person are you? And do you have good judgment? Are you a jerk? We don't want a jerk on the court. You know, are you going to be able to handle this work that was the more that those que the questions from the judges were more of that nature I don't know if Judge Westmore and Judge DeMarkey felt the same way but I got more probing questions about my cases from the merit selection panel than I did from the district judges and I think they just wanted to see how I fit in more than anything else I, I agree with you 100 percent I mean that that was my the exact experience that I had I felt like it was a much more of a social conversation, I felt like they were wanting to determine, the judges were wanting to determine whether or not I was somebody who they could see as a colleague, mm -hmm. um, whether they could like me or not. I mean, you know, you have to, we all have to work together and there, it's a very collegial uh, bench. So I think they wanna make sure that you would fit in, um, in that culture. And uh, they just wanna know if you can do the work. First and foremost, I think they want to know if you can do the work and if you can carry a load, because I mean, that's why we're here, right? You know, we have, it's a very busy court. We have a lot of cases and can we carry our weight? It, you know, is what they're looking at. Can we handle a full caseload of all kinds of cases um, and, you know, step up and do it, even though it's a huge challenge and you have a, a uh, huge learning curve. What are you going to draw on to be able to get this job done? I think I, that's what I felt like they were asking of me. And I agree. That was my experience as well, that the judges were interested in finding out whether I would be a good colleague. But also there was a, a part of the interview, and my last one I interviewed both in San Jose and San Francisco, that um, was about um, my thinking about what problems or issues the district faced, what I would do about that. There were questions about sort of court, just, just what would be, um, you know, matters of concern to the court. And I found like, I, I really enjoyed those questions because I had been an advocate for so long um, that there were lots of things I felt I could say about that, um, that things that, that I thought could be, um, you know, things that, could be addressed. The, it was things about pro se litigants. I had represented mm -hmm. pro se litigants on a pro bono basis before, you know, things like that. And I thought those were really excellent questions and one, ones that invited um, very thoughtful answers where you could demonstrate why you really cared about the job. So that was a feature of the district judges interview that was not, um, not so much the focus of the merit selection panel interview. So my experience of final 
my final round was same as Judge DeMarkey, that there was a lot of discussion about here are the challenges we face as judges and what do you think? There's no good answer here. We just want to get your thoughts on it. And then there was a lot of information sharing. They were, they were sharing with me what they struggled with as judges, um, challenges that they had as judges. And I really felt it was a communication uh, uh, that was very open um, where the judges were sharing what their life was like. But we were obviously evaluating each other. Can we see each other as colleagues? And can, and, they probably value, were probably evaluating me. Can I be, you know, a, a a representative of the court? And how how would how would I do in that role? Um, you know, we we all have now we represent the Northern District of California as judges, and so we we, we we're not just our own judge. In some ways, we speak as a bench. So there is going to be that kind of review that happens. But it was in terms of stress level. Um, I think the DJ round was was not. Um, I felt very comfortable. I felt like I was communicating with them as colleagues already, um, as opposed to the panel, which was, uh, I felt like a fairly structured list of questions. Um, no real surprises in any of the questions, um, but um, but it was it was much more structured um, than the DJ round, which was uh, which I thought was a very enjoyable experience. I I enjoyed my final round quite a bit. Um, so if, uh, if you're fortunate enough to make it, I, I think that's, that's really a time for you to shine, uh, to reveal who you are and to learn more about them as, as potentially your future colleagues. I think the thing they're looking for in that interview is, are you comporting yourself like a judge in that you are there equal? Not that you're arrogant or that you're, um, presumptuous about your relationship with them, but are you comfortable sitting in a room with seven to 10 district judges and holding your own. Because if you aren't, you can't be a judge. Yeah. If you're nervous and quaking, you cannot be a judge. Yeah. If you're comfortable in that scenario, that's what they want to see. How comfortable are you in that? And then, I don't think they would say that, but I think that implicitly that's what they're looking for. And if you think about it, it makes sense because it is intimidating. Yeah. But if yeah. you're comfortable with it and it shows, then they think, okay, this person can handle the job. And the thought of the thought of being interviewed by you know a bunch of district judges that you've you know appeared in front of can be a very scary thought. But I found that when you get there um, and you have the interview, they make you feel very comfortable, and you really. I felt like we just had a conversation. Yeah, I really do. Uh, one question is: Do all the DJs participate in this DJ interview? And the answer for me, no. I don't think any, I don't think any of us had all the DJs. Uh, but they vote. There, there's, there's a vote that's taken on the MJs. Um, okay, let's make sure. Okay, we are, we are on schedule. And what I'd like to do now is to officially open up the chat to questions if we haven't been able to cover yours. Um, so let the questions begin. And uh, we'll do as much as we can before we have to adjourn for the evening. Um, and, but before we do that, um, I don't know if anybody else has anything to say. I'm, I'm quickly kind of making sure. Somebody asked, uh, what about coming from a geographic area outside of California? Yes, I'm not aware of a prohibition on that. Um, I, 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 I could see that be ch being challenging because you might not know the community, the legal community and what the Northern District is like. and. And as I mentioned in the beginning, the Northern District MJs do a different job than another district. So, um, you know, you might have to do more homework in figuring out um, uh, uh, what we do. But I think more important is how are you going to advocate for why you should be a magistrate judge in this district? And you might have very compelling personal reasons why you're applying to the district. Oh, here's a good one, um, Judge C. Yeah, no, please go is, ahead. Is serving as an in-house oh, counsel yeah. who largely manages uh, litigation rather than directly litigating viewed as a negative. That's a very interesting question. Mm -hmm. what, do you, I don't know, what do you think? I don't know if any magistrate judge has ever come only from that background. Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. I think having some direct, some direct litigation experience is gonna be required. I'm just not sure how much. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like there's some litigation. I mean, if you're managing litigation, 
I mean, I assume you must have had litigation experience in order to rise to yeah. a litigation management position. And so I think when you probably put all of those experiences together, you might be able to um, have sufficient experience. It really just depends on what the, the whole background is of the other person. Um, what are the diversity statistics for MJs? In our district, why don't you, Alex, tell everyone? Um, I think we're very diverse. I think we can always do better. We can always we can always uh, add uh, a variety. Um, so, but in terms of, I, I don't know if I want to. You can easily go online and figure out who we all are. We all have our public uh, profiles. Um, but one of the, the things that I want to make sure if we haven't emphasized it, and I know my colleagues are very enthusiastic about this, that this is something that the district uh, uh, is very committed to, uh, not just at the MJ level, but at, at every level. And, and I, I will speak on behalf of myself. I think that the best results come from a, a really diverse viewpoint and, uh, and that we represent a variety of backgrounds and experience um, because these are very personal issues that we deal with every day. And so uh, we need to be able to reflect the community in which we serve. So that's only my, my, but I, I don't. And think that's why we're doing, that's why we're doing this because yes. we want to make sure that we reach out to the larger community and also provide this, you know, demystifying, you know, the process uh, information to people who might have, you know, some people, some people self, what do you call it, self-deselect or, you know, yeah. deselect themselves for various reasons. And so I think having something like this might talk them out of doing that, hopefully. Somebody wants to know if the identity of the selection panel is secret. So the, the answer to that is we don't have that information. Uh, do we want to comment on work-life balance? We want to talk a little bit about what it's like. Do we have lives? Do we do? What do we do? I mean, I think right now it's Zoom. I mean, I've been called a Zoom judge. Well, I, I <laughs> want to say one thing about about work-life balance in, yes. in, in this way. So, um, I came to this position having worked as a partner in a private law firm, and that was a stressful job. Coming here. I know I was really pleasantly surprised about one thing, which is this is also a stressful job, but the stress is totally different. And I'm not entirely sure exactly why I feel this way. And maybe it's just me, but I felt that having control over more things like when you get your orders out or just your schedule mm -hmm. made a huge difference. I probably worked at least in my first couple of years, worked more hours, literally doing this job than I did in private practice, except maybe the times when I was in trial. But um, it, so it's a huge amount of work and it is stressful, especially when you're first starting, but the, the control that you have makes a huge difference. And that made a big difference in my sort of job satisfaction and in my personal life, my kids noticed I wasn't as grumpy. So that's one thing I would say about this job that was a huge, pleasant surprise. I had the Somebody opposite asked. experience that I was in. Oh, you had the opposite experience? Oh. No, no, I had the opposite experience in terms of the work balance. I was in private practice and I found that this job is much more manageable in terms of hours in private practice, much, much more manageable. Um, and, and I, but I agree 100% with Judge DeMarkey is that it is, I don't feel the stress because I'm not billing, I'm not collecting, I'm not getting new clients and I can, and I'm just doing the right thing all the time. So I don't have to worry about, I just worry about making the right decision. And that's the greatest job in the world. So for that reason, I don't feel stress in my job. All the things I didn't like about private practice are gone. And all the parts that I did like, the thinking, the writing, the intellectual rigor, and the ability to do the right thing all the time. So I, I would say my work-life balance is much, much better or it feels much, much better. Maybe the hours are the same or more, but it feel, I agree with Judge Markey, it feels so, so different. Yeah. Which was more you want to add to that? Somebody asked, um, 
Somebody asked, are there any restrictions, young and old? And that just brought to mind uh, that I, I was looking at the application um, that the and noted that the position, our, our position ends at age seven. You, you can't and, be more than 70 and apply. I think that's the rule. Right, and, and even if you are currently a magistrate judge, your position ends at 70, but then you can, you can request to be reappointed each year, every year after that. But it's year by year after that, instead of in the, the eight year. So that actually challenge. answers another question. So we all serve on, on a term of eight years at a time, and then we have to go through a reappointment process where there's a merit selection panel that convenes that, um, that is charged with going out to the community and getting feedback on how the magistrate judge has been performing. Um, so we, uh, all of us are still in the term. Some have already made it past their first eight year term. Um, and I'm in my second term. You're in your second term. So you've already gone through the, um, the review from the, the sound of the selection panel, I guess, um i don't yeah, know there is. All that. There, there's a panel um yes um okay all right um we we are now at, at 6 20 so um i want to give panelists any final remarks comments reactions uh we'll start with judge uh, demarkey Oh, I'm not sure I have any other um, final remarks or reactions. Um, we've been covering a lot of uh, a lot of information. Um, I think the questions from the chat maybe indicate that the application isn't posted yet. You can look online, you can Google it, and you can probably find older versions of it. I don't think it's changed. So for those of you who are eager to see it, um, you can you can definitely find it somewhere. Um, and you can probably also Google Judge Kim's interview about <laughs> her experience as I did um, and find out what she said about um, uh, more details about the merit selection process as well. Um, so uh, I think it will only be posted for 30 days. So uh, I may be wrong about that. Judge C may have better information, but I think that's how long it's, it stays open. So um, yes, starting sooner rather sure. than later is, is a good plan. Um, and um, I think also uh, there are going to be other opportunities to ask questions. I think Judge C, we'll let folks know yes. about that then. Okay. So um, at, at once we run through this, I've, I've already posted a link. Uh, well, why don't I do it now? So uh, we actually have invited and they all eagerly agree to participate. Uh, our former MJs, alums of the job, I have all agreed to be um, a, a networking opportunity. You can ask some questions to them. So I posted a link that will allow you to uh, connect with one of these former MJs and ask them questions about their application process, what would make a successful application. So I thought that the link would be at the top of the, of the chat, um, but it's now, um, going to be right now, so it's right in the middle. Unfortunately, if you look for for me, you'll see the link. Um, and I've just received information that the application will be posted on our webpage on Friday. This link that I just posted, how to connect with a former MJ, will also be on that uh, on our webpage. So if you don't happen to get it on this chat, uh, you can find it on the webpage. So, um, but Judge DeMarkey and, and others who said the application hasn't really changed. Uh, you actually, if you're serious about it, um, you can get a few extra um, uh, uh, days uh, to think about it. Okay, unfortunately, it doesn't seem like, oh, yes, I see my problem. I've only been sending it to the panelists, so one more time. <laughs> I thought the first time I actually did send it to everybody, but now let's. It will be on the website, right? Yes, it will be on the website because I can't seem to get this. Okay, I now send it to everyone. There it is. Um, yes. Okay, let's let's continue with final remarks. Uh, Judge Westmore, do you have final remarks for our audience? Um, you know, I would just reiterate that if you're considering applying, do it. Um, if you if you are feeling like you don't have enough 
of some particular type of experience, look back into your um, experience and draw on things that you do have experience with and try to extrapolate for, from that on how uh, it helps you, helps qualify you uh, in other ways for the job. And if, and at, like Judge Kim mentioned, if you are lacking in some area, go ahead and start filling out the application and go out and do some things, volunteer, do some pro bono work, uh, you know, do something to beef up uh, your application, but go ahead and open up that application uh, and get started filling it out. Judge Kim. What I said earlier, I would repeat, and that is, this is not just for people who are gonna apply now, but think about the long-term. This mm -hmm. is a great job. You can prepare yourself. You can get the experience if you want it to get prepared for this job. And so I would highly encourage you to look to the future, even if you're not ready today. Okay. Well, um, I think we've covered a lot of ground this evening. I hope it's been productive. I certainly think it's been productive. And if we have encouraged one of you to submit an application when you weren't necessarily thinking you were going to do it, then I think we've achieved success here. Um, I, uh, I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank my colleagues. They're wonderful people to work with, um, but I'm biased. And I think that those of you who are out there who are interested in applying, you should. And so uh, when one of you is selected to be the MJ, I want you to reveal yourself that you saw it here first, or maybe <laughs> not, um, but it would be great. Um, and we would welcome you uh, fully to the court. So I hope this has been helpful. Um, this is recorded, so in the event you've missed some of it, or you have friends out there or associates who are, weren't able to see it, I believe it will be recorded and available so that you can uh, hear the information that, that, that came through. Okay, um, with that, I wish everyone a, a uh, safe and uh, as we are still uh, working through our pandemic, so I wish everyone good health and, and safety. And uh, good night. Good night. Thank you. Okay.